are talking today about validating how will your IMRT VMAT delivery match your TBS model by using patient-specific QA and end-to-end -end testing. Okay. Actually, this is a standalone presentation. It's like one, one presentation in a group of other presentations just to build our IMRT VMAT technique in our center. So we, we, start, we have started with type P and type C uh, algorithms and how they, what's the difference between each other and how we use them for treatment planning and patient-specific QA as well. And last week lecture was about detectors, how choices of detectors, how, which detector can we use for our measurements and so on. And today we are validating how will IMRT delivery will be matching our, Q, our Q, TBS model. Okay, this is our outline for today's session. It will be like very quick introduction about We'll see about the difference between 3D and IMRT. I know all of you see this introduction a lot of times, but yeah, we have to go through it. End-to-end -end and patient specific QA. Why? Why we need to do this test and how we can do it in proper way. And then discuss different phantoms for end-to-end -end and patient specific QA and how we use the proper detector as well. Explain how theaters measure in a phantom and quick difference between type B and type C and how, what's the difference in calculations in our phantoms and what is the importance of selecting the proper phantom parts or densities when we are using each algorithm. And then what is the relative end-to-end -end test? It will speak in a quick slide about this. What, the, what about what we mean here by relative end-to-end -end test as well? Okay, as all of you know, this is like conformal formal radiotherapy. It's like open fields. And at the end, we have this homogeneous dose distribution around inside the BTV and even so it will be like square or circle with no inhomogeneity in doses. So it will be like homogeneous dose in whole target. But for IMRT, as, as you can see, we have like inhomogeneities of doses. So we have hot areas and cold areas relative to each other inside the BTV because we are, we are treating with different dose prescriptions in the same target. So that's the main difference and that's the complexity of the IMRT. It's like the shape of the dose and the shape of and the intensity of doses within the BTV or within the targets. And based on that, for conformal radiotherapy, we can we can measure the point the absolute dose in, in in any part of the BTV and it will be the same at whole PTVs because it's like as you said it's like homogeneous dose. But for IMRT we can we need to measure the cumulative delivered dose, whole dose to, to be should be measured. It's not only one segment because it's it's not representative for all other segments and how how it will be. And at the same at the same time we need to measure those at different locations or multiple locations to get a figure about the fluence or the dose in whole target area. This is the main difference here between IMRT and conformal radiotherapy from our perspective today, or our point of view today during for the measurement of us. We have this question, quick question. It's like the best way to validate your treatment planning system for VMAT plan is to a, measure a single stair step pattern using a high resolution 2D array and ensure that the plan, the plan passes 2% to milli with 95% gamma. Measure a single double APM TG119 spinal cord plan and ensure that the plan passes 3% to milli with 90% gamma. Perform patient specific QA using gamma and point dose analysis on a multiple detector array for plus 15 min patients and study the trends, perform the IROC and IEA TLD validation prior to. So I will we'll run this poll now and hope we can. So hopefully everybody should see that poll question. Give it a good 20, 30 seconds. Let people answer. You can see the responses coming in. Yeah. Give it maybe 20 more seconds to be full yeah. minute. Yeah, we still have some. <laughs> Getting a lot of good participation over 70%.
people responded. Okay, thank you. All right, yeah, all in the poll. Yeah, thank and you. share the share the results. Okay, thank you. Most people, yeah, most people look like they answered C. Yeah. Okay. Let's see how. Yeah, we still have like twenty six percent, and yeah, still have like valuable percentages for other selections. So we'll run this again and see what. Okay, so now we are going to end to end test. How we perform this end to end test? After we commissioned IMRT technique, and so IMRT end to end test and specific QA must done to evaluate the whole process of our clinical implementation of IMRT. So it, it, we, we, we end in this test to st starting from registration of the patient until the beam delivery and to get and to, to be sure or to assess the those or treatment delivered in the proper way. That's that's the idea of end-to-end -end test. Okay, so we are starting from register the patient even on R and B system, then take our phantom here uh, and do like CT, scan the phantom in the same positioning as using the clinical protocols we are using for the patient. So if I'm I have a phantom, I I, I need to scan using like pelvis for prostate patients. So I, I use like pelvis protocol for scanning or for thorax, I, I use the thorax for the, something for the patient. So using the same clinical protocol I am I'm using, import CT data into planning system, then create PTVs and organ at risk, run calculations and perform calculations, prepare plan. And here for running optimizer, we need to mimic like we need like to have like some, some segmentations for the, the plan and something like this just to, to measure like a proper IMRT. So I have like flow ins and I have this inhomogeneity in the in the target. Prepare plan for delivery. And if I am using kind of mosaic, so we need to export to mosaic and prepare, promote the beams and something like that. If I'm using Eclipse, so I need to prepare on area. And then deliver the plan to Phantom as, as a patient and measure the delivered dose using our detector, which we'll talk about later on, and then compare our measured versus calculated doses. This is the how the workflow of end-to-end -end test. So it's it's the idea of moving through all steps of the treatment, starting from registration till the treatment. So, it, and actually, it's very, very important to implement this into in this to if there is anything within in, in between steps, so you can pick up during this test. So the idea is it's not just delivered beam and measure, and that's all. We need to proper end to end test. Okay, there is published plans which is published on double ABM one one nine. It's like it's really very nice plans and it's like standard plans and you can you can find how to create the plans and something like that so it's and it's step by step going from simple plan to complex plan and you need to to do all the plans to track how how the complexity how the treatment plan system dealing with different scenarios of your patients so starting from abba fields simple fields and then bands here it's like it's like sliding windows, so a kind of sliding windows to and to check how 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 your plan planning system versus delivered mean, and then this is like multiple targets and more prostate patient and more head and neck patient and C shaped targets. This that is the six types of plans you can use for your end to end, to end test. And in this in this situation, you are testing your planning system from starting from very simple plans to the highest complex plan, and using for IMRT from open field to IMRT segment. Okay, I'll jump back to this slide. But here, this is like patient specific QA. So now we spoke about why we need this, how we do the end to end test. Now we need to know how to do the patient specific QA and what's the difference between. For patient specific QA, we are checking the plan delivered to the patient, but we deliver it to the phantom and measure it on the phantom 
And if it's delivered correctly to the phantom, definitely it will be somehow the same in the patient. So for patient-specific QA, we need to do it for all of our IMRT and DMAT plans, especially for the beginning of our implementation of this technique and to, to know the trends of how, how this will implement it. So complete the plan for the patient on TBS as per your clinic protocol. So the same, scan the patient, do your scan, deliver, do planning on your planning system on for your patients. It's like normal clinical patient. And but before we deliver, we will create a verification plan, which is or QA plan, depends which plan system you're using. And then after then, when you create a verification plan, that means you are copying the same kind of address a little bit, but which which treatment sites should people select for their end-to-end tests? Just one treatment site or multiple, or how should they select that? Sorry, I, I can't hear. Let me check. Sorry, for, so for the end-to-end tests you were talking about earlier, which treatment sites should people select for performing yeah. the end-to-end tests? Yeah, that's, that's according to, we need to do this different scenarios. So it depends, yeah, so we need like head and neck, so the, the, the most complex cases are hidden because you have a lot of organ at risk and sorry you have a lot of organ at risk and you have this concave shape target so it's like will be the, the most complex patient plan we have prostate which is quite easier so we are ranging from this the, the easiest to the hard sites so that and when you do end-to-end test you need to do both of them and in addition to the other plans as shown in uh, TG 150, uh, 190. You, so if your clinic, for instance, possibly maybe they don't do a lot of head and neck, can you kind of tailor it to your clinic or should you still do? Yeah, like I think it's to do, yeah. W- once you are validating your system, because you are validating your system, you, it's better to do all of them. So if they don't treat today, but after two months, they think about, okay, we we're, we're going to treat something. And in that case, you need to do all end-to-end tests from, from scratch. Because, yeah, that's that's one point. The other point, we'll speak after one minute about why we are doing, actually, why we are doing the end-to-end test. And one of them is to validate the accuracy of your model and the accuracy in two ways. One of the beam modeling, the beam characteristic modeling, and the other one is the machine characteristic modeling. So when I'm trying to do like intensive end-to-end test, I, I, I'll be sure that I model my machine in proper way. So if it was like easy to, or it was like quick modeling or using only easy cases for my end-to-end test, and after a while I got high, high, high modulated patient or something like that, in that case, do you, how you will pick up this change? Will you redo end-to-end test for this, or you will just continue doing your QAs, specific QA, and forget about this fine-tuning for modeling? And if you are doing fine-tuning for modeling again, you need to do proper commissioning and a lot of a lot of work. So, in my opinion, if you are doing your commissioning now for this technique, you expect it to do all cases from the simple to the complex plant. Gotcha. That makes sense. So you want to kind of try to account for any possible treatment that yeah. you might be yeah. delivering on that machine. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So, of creating a verification plan, the idea of creating a verification plan is we are copying the beam with the beam segments and everything and beam monitor units and weights, everything from, from the fields, we copy this these beams to the phantom, my, my, my own phantom, which I used for measurements. And then we calculate just to represent the dose to the my detector. After this, this recalculation, I make my I take my phantom, set up the phantom on the machine and deliver the beam and for the, the deliver the plan in the QA and then measure the liver dose and compare what was measured and against what was calculated in planning system. Uh, this is uh, this is how the patient specific QA and here is it's called patient specific QA because it's all each beam is so each plan is specific for specific patients. 
it's not the same. So if I have like two or three hedonic patients, can I only three, uh, do the, this patient this test for only one plan? No, it should be per patient because each patient will be treated differently. I mean, from the how the optimizer working on his structures and how is the change in his PTE and something like that. Okay, so the main reasons for patient for end to end, why you are using end to end test and why you are using patient specific QA. We are using the end to end test mainly for some things. Number one, validating the beam model for like checking the output factors, how how it was is, was it measured correctly or or not? Especially for IMRT, you are using segments, small segments. So the small field size, how how it was measured. It was if there is any discrepancy between the measured and and calculated. So we need to think about all of this. How is my was my small field size measured in proper way correctly or not? I, did I use the proper detector as was discussed in the previous presentation or not? That's, that's, that's one, one thing. The other thing is the accuracy of machine modeling. That's, that's the point. One other point, and which is it's not related to the measurement, but it's actually how, how I represent my MLC inside my model. So is DLG was done correctly, measured correctly, and the factors calculated correctly and entered in the proper way, DLG for variant and or and also the MLC transmission factor, was it correctly embedded inside the uh, uh, planning system? In that case, because as you know, for IMRT, in IMRT, you are mainly using the MLC for all of our treatment. So that's that's a good a good test to check it was modeled in a, in a proper way. The other thing uh, for end end to end test, it's not it's it's not related to the machine itself, but it's related to the whole process. So they view the whole process and confirm the workflow of patient from CT scan until the beam delivery. Everything was smoothly. All beams transferred from planning system to mosaic, for example, correctly. All control points are moved correctly. Monitor units are represented correctly. All of this kind of things, it should, should be checked in this one. And after validating my planning and everything is fine, end-to-end -end test all passed, all my absolute doses were perfect and everything is fine. After that, we need to perform at least 15 clinical plans, patient-specific period. Why we need to, to do that? Actually, end-to-end -end test, we are treating phantom. And we are, as you say, uh, all, all, all cases we, we, we represent, it, it was drawn by yourself, just this structures, it's not I, not real structures, not real organ at risk, not, not real BTVs or targets. So for end to end this, we are treating phantom, but for patient-specific QA, we are in clinical situations. So, and in clinical situations, definitely optimizer will, will work in different way. So optimization, optimizer will, do different segments and and co maybe complex plans, more complex plans that than we did in end to end test, and so that's that's the idea of using this patient specific QA. And then, if we are tracking at least 20, 50, 25, something like that, and all results were okay, so that means my clinical situations or my clinic real clinical plans as well are passing my criteria, which is. Now I am. That's that's the importance of doing the patient specific QA as well, and doing the track for this to know how how to, how it goes. And for patient specific QA, actually we are doing like both point dose and gamma analysis, which is into the array and something like that. Okay, so from the previous two slides, we need two things actually, which is more very important to us. Phantoms, we need to select our proper phantom. So we need, like, what is the different phantoms we have available in the markets? Like water phantom, water equivalent phantoms or solid water, BMMA, plastic phantoms or anthropomorphic phantom or body phantom, something like that. And for detectors, we have like point detectors like ion chambers, diodes, micro diamonds, TLDs, and so on. 
also we have 2D detectors like arrays, films, and a bit, or 3D detectors, which recent, yeah, still, yeah, recent a little bit, which is like gel isometry. You have those for in 3D. Our current presentation, we are focusing on point detectors. So we mainly will we'll talk about the point detectors because we are mainly here, we will talk about the point dose measurement for the 2D or the gamma analysis and something like that. They will, there will be like a different presentation only for how to analyze and how to do this patient specific UAA for gamma analysis and so on. So definitely we'll, today we'll speak about the point detectors only. Okay, for phantoms, we need to select the proper phantom or not select. If, if I have phantom, how I can how can I deal with it? Or if I don't have phantom, which phantom will be better to use for my test? Okay, we have like slab phantoms, which is in most of our centers. And slab phantoms or Q phantoms or geographic, this is like, we need to think about the material of that phantom, is it solid water or is it PMMA? And because it's like two different materials and two different materials, meaning that our, my algorithm will deal differently because it's like how, how the photon will interact with these materials relative to the water front, which is already known. Measurement depth and where, where I place my detector and I have to, I must use the same depth for the scanning machine treatment and planning and treatment. It should be the same. So I have to, I should know where I place my vector exactly. And setup accuracy, which is quite tricky, important to, to know the setup accuracy for, especially for slapping, for slab phantoms, you know, we have like slab like five centimeters, four centimeters, two, one, something like that, the slab thickness. So that this, the, how I place this slabs above each other in the scanning, or should be the same as in the treatment stage. If there is any differences, sometimes you will have some discrepancy in your readings and this is, should be taken into account. And this is actually, this phantom is used mainly for the tomotherapy machines. It's like circular phantom. And as, as you can see, this green light is like where you can place your film. And all of these roads representing the places where you can put your ion chambers. And it is actually it's rotated, so you can, in either plans, you can measure in the horizontal or vertical plans. You can you can use it. And at the same time, and actually one one good thing here is you can there is there is like a version of it, which has like this insertions, which is like for uh, different materials. So you have like different densities in your phantom, and that represent more realistic situation. In this here, you can see, you can use different ion chambers at the same time, and you can, so you can measure absolute doses at different points at the same, uh, at different, uh, at the same time. And in that case, you can validate or verify your point dose in target or critic and critical structures and high dose region and low dose regions and something like that. So that is, that's the good thing in this cheese phantom actually. And unlike other phantoms, which you need to change that to measure different at different times to, to measure the point dose. Let's say it's like, this is like more advanced phantoms or something like that, which is used actually for the whole, whole patient specific UA, where you can validate the fluence and absolute those at the same time. So we have different phantoms. One of them is arc check. Arc check is, as you all know, it's like helical detectors outside, which used, it, it's outside here, which is used for the 2D measurements or let's say the fluence measurements, which to be discussed later in a, a different presentation. And, and in, in center, you have either this single hole where you uh, plug, which used for point point dose or detectors placed here at the center and measure the point dose, or this is called multi-plug for detectors where you can place the, your detector in, in anywhere in different places. 
here is the CT is done for this phantom. This is the CT for the real phantom. And can, you can see this is like multi-blood. And here is the central central plug where we used for the beam at eye center, but you can cha change it and put your detector at each, at any place of this and check the point in different places as well, which is much, much easier. But this one is the, it's like artificial deficit coming from sun nuclear and you have only the, this, you can have only this, the ion chamber is at the eye center, you can place it and otherwise you can you can change it because you don't know how exactly it will be there other, rather than this, which you can know exactly where you perform your ion check. So this is two types of arc checks and both are used in those measurements as well as the clones measurements. This phantom is IBM, IBA, sorry, IBA, sorry, that's misspelling. So IBA, IMRT phantom. And this is specific for the point dose and film geometry measurements. As you can see as well, here is like multi-blugs and or plugs where you can place your ion chamber anywhere inside this box and then run the UA. There is another more realistic phantom, which is a CIRS phantom, which is like representing kind of the real life patients or real life phantoms. Here you can see this one is for lung, for example. So this is for thorax, you have here lung inserts. And this is the plug of used for the ion chamber, which can be changed and changeable. You can move it here. And if you want to measure inside the lung, you can put it here and inside the lung and measure it. And here the cord, for example, if you, if you, if you want to place it inside the cord, you can use it. And this is this is one of them. And they have another one for the bulbs as well, which is should be like, yeah, this is like scan for it. And where as you can see, you can see the bone. This is like that. And here you can see the second spine. And here it's like this is the ion chamber place or the your your chamber, which maybe represent like kind of prostate. And this is like a bladder if you want to measure those, if you have like prostate plan, so you need to measure, you want to measure in prostate and you need to measure in organ at risk as well for your end-to-end -end test. In that case, you can use this different plugs, places. The, the most important thing when you are scanning your phantom, you have to place your detector inside it. That's, that's a really critical point you need to do when you are scanning. Otherwise, it will. It may in your calculations later. It will, it will affect your calculation accuracy. So, if you are using like film, for example, this one. If you are using film, you you need to place a film and scan the phantom using the film. If you are using ion chamber, you need to put the ion chamber and scan you the phantom with the ion chamber as well. The last and the most complex. A phantom is anthropomorphic a phantom or body phantom, which is representing the whole body of the patient, the whole body. It's it's really nice one, but it's a very complex one as well. The complexity of it is the how to set up it, how to set up this phantom every time in the correct positions and in a proper way. And a lot of techniques done like numbering the slices or doing some markers on something like that, but still quite time consuming. And at the same time, as you see inside inside the phantom, this is like CT inside this from this phantom. And you can see a lot of holes or adapters here to put TLDs or you'll at some places you'll find like place to put films and, and something like that. So that's that is a good thing in this phantom so it's like mimic for the patient itself and you can use different detectors at the same time and using it to 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 measure deliver those at the same time as well. for the uh, anthropomorphic phantom you just uh, just need to have uh you must have till the reader yeah yeah this this is yeah and, and uh, we have another section for the Detectors, which detectors to, to you to be used, and we will speak to this. Yeah, we'll speak about TLD as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
And the good thing is it's like a patient, really. It's a real patient. But in setup, you need, that's, that's the idea. It's in setup, you need to set the patient on your machine at the same position as done for during your treatment, during your scan. So in that case, you can use CBCT, Combim CT. You, have, you need to do Combim CT to set up the patient in the good position, same position, and a bit or SGRT as well. Sometimes it helps out. Okay, as you can see, we have here like different types of phantoms and we have different, these different types of phantoms uh, had like different types of materials are made of. And because of that, and there is like a lot of inhomogeneities and something like that. And how the photons or the my X-ray or photons will interact with each of this material, it will be, it, it's like a crucial, point or important point to take into account. So when I am using the phantom, I have to represent the correct density inside my planning system to calculate it accurately and, and then impact on my measurements. Actually, there is a nice two papers that have been done, especially for this plastic water or the BMMA. These two papers, really it discussed what are the differences between water, solid water, and the plastic water or the plastic phantoms, and how it affects each other, how, how, how they affect the, the calculations, and how we can apply factors to correct all of these changes. And this is, this is the main things are differences. It's like stopping power for different materials, different will be different. So if we see here that this is water, solid water, and BMMA, based on that, you will have different different those interactions and in that case if you are entering like solid water data on planning system for your phantom and you are measuring in beam in a phantom you will have different values so it will measure it will calculate those different from what you are really measuring that is the important thing here so that's the idea why we need to think about or or to introduce the correct phantom densities or phantom material. Mama, and well, yeah. A quick question related to this that we're getting some questions on, and you, you brought up the important aspect of scanning your phantom with the chamber in it. Do you need to do anything in terms of a density override to the chamber? Like one of the questions is, do you, do you need to force your chamber yeah. cavity to be water equivalent? What do you do with that? Yeah, yeah. we are going to discuss this in detail in our algorithm. How, 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 how we, gotcha. our, our, yeah. Okay, and actually the mass energy absorption, definitely because we have like different materials, how, how the beam interacts and going from air to BMMA to ion chamber or going from air to water to ion chambers. All of this, it will affect our calculation accuracy when I am doing my measurements. So the comparison should be either. So I need to, compare or compare apple to apple, not apple to orange. This is the most important thing here when I am scanning and when I am doing my measurements on the planning system. That's that's a critical point, actually. Okay, so this is my, okay, this is related, related to the phantom itself. Okay, my housing, my, yeah, my body or my vision. Okay, what about the detector? For detector, we need to think about which is proper detector to, to be used. Okay, for example, here for IMRT pa patients, if I am, as you know, if, if I am doing like IMRT with different fluences or something like that, and I I have my ion chamber or I have a volume where I am I am measuring in in the center of high semi homogeneous patient, same homogeneous dose. So in that case, I I will have this kind of, the mean dose, if you, if you can see, it's like minimum and maximum, there is no big differences. So the mean dose for this red line, it's almost homogeneous, so I can place my chamber, whatever it is. But if I am placing my chamber in those gradient area, so that means for the blue one, you have like, 209 
and two point, from, ranging those from, from 2093 to 2.873. So as you can see, so where I can place my ion chamber and how the volume of my chamber, my ion chamber, my volume, my ion chamber volume is quite big, like firmer chamber. I will have all of this, those homogeneity inside my active volume, which affects my accuracy of measurements. But, but if I am using a kind of a small ion chamber with high resolution or high resolution ion chamber like pinpoint or, or something like that, so that means I can place my ion chamber in a position or in a place where I don't have this massive dose gradient. That's that's one thing related to that detector itself. Okay, so that's that's when I'm saying well, this this point should be in my top of head when I'm thinking about which detector I need to use. Okay, cylindrical ion chamber should be used. The size of ion chamber is important and we need to think about which volume, which ion chamber size I need to be, should be used for this. If I am measuring in, if you remember, in 3D plan, so I can use firmware for that. But for IMRT, I need to think about this point of those gradient. So in that case, I need to think about high high resolution and small small size small size uh, ion chamber. Okay, for ion chamber, the ionization chamber size should be small enough to limit the dose heterogeneity across the chamber active volume to ten dose across the across the chamber active volume to ten and five percent if the measurements are being compared against volume. So it's volume against volume, so 10% or 5% if it was like 5. Transition chamber electrode should be fabricated out of low Z material like aluminum. Okay, and I think this was discussed last, in last presentation, but yeah, just to remember. When high Z electrode are used, the chamber should be cross calibrated in condition to minimize the, for the idea why you are doing the cross calibration to minimize the photon spectral differences at the same depth and minimize the field size differences as well. Okay, the measurement protocol, I leave this to read alone, but one, one thing is, this is the, uh, okay. with ion chambers, so if I'm, I'm using ion chambers, and for end-to-end -to -end test, I need to implement or apply all of my factors like depolarization, B ionization, TB, uh, KTB or PTB, Electrometer factors, NDW, all of this should be done, should be implemented in my absolute dose end to end test. Okay, so it's not a relative quick one. So we need to implement everything in a proper way. So I need to do to check for my specific for my detector use it used for this test. We need to apply all of these factors. And that's the that's a Really, it's, it's important for end-to-end -end test to use it. Some some people may say, okay, I'll do like cross collaboration against farmer, so I'll measure in farmer 10 by 10 at 10 centimeter farmer using farmer and using pinpoint and make like a relative measurement for each other. This is not good for end-to-end -end test, actually. You have to do it in a proper way, so you need to get like calibrated chamber, pinpoint chamber, if you are using pinpoint which is ideally used for IMRT plans, measurements, and get a calibrated one and measure all factors for it and use these factors for your absolute measurement. <clears throat> for dye detectors, if I'm using like single point for dye detectors, for measurement relative dose distribution, for measuring MLC pin numbers and so on, for providing those measurement points supplemental to ionization, if I have some issues with my, to compare against my ion chamber or something like that. Uh, selection, use unshielded dye electro uh, detectors. Dye detectors designed for in vivo exometry shouldn't be used for in phantom measurements. And that's that's a good. Uh, this is another thing. If I have like in vivo system which is used outside the body, or it's, it's just uh, yeah, uh, it's stick on the skin. So I can I. It's not recommended to use this this dye to to be to measure inside the phantom. It will give you an accurate dose. Diode response varies with the orientation. So if I'm using diode, I have to be carefully to account for diode. Uh, 
position orientation against the high gantry. So if the gantry is 90, that means I I will have like in inaccurate dose from this beam. So I need to take take care about the orientation of the detector. <clears throat> okay, for TLD, for TLDs detectors, if I am going to use it, if the phantom is not along ion chambers like anthropomorphic and when multiple simultaneous points need to be measured at the same time so i can use the tld detector tld selection i have to use this one low atomic number for tlds and for measurement protocol should be a strict annealing and calibration protocol should be adopted that provides relative response factors for individual chips and care should be taken to assure that the user accurately knows the tld positions with respect to the linear accelerator as well. And for, for, for sure, if you have like this, if you have TLDs, you are measuring on TLDs, you, have, you should have like your TLD reader in, in your center. Otherwise it will affect, yeah. Otherwise you, you may need to stay, if you are sending this TLD to another center or something like that, it will be like, not 100% accurate measurements because sometimes if you are the time from radiation to uh, reading this uh, TLDs and the variation in temperatures and variation in lights and something like all of this affecting the accuracy of TLD readings. So the ideal situation, if you are using TLD chips to have your reader on, on one side, so once you did you, you run your measurements, it, will be the same in the environment on the same area, same temperature and all of this. So you don't have this discrepancy between the measurement place and the reading of TLD place. Okay, so for the planning system step, here we have as, as it was the- uh, What was the reason for using the low lithium TLD? The low atomic number. Yeah, yeah. What was the reason for that? Is for the sensitivity, because it's more sensitive for the whole doses. Because here we are, we are measuring like absolute doses. The difference is between type C and type B. Uh, actually, I found this nice comparison between type C and type B algorithms. And uh, it was um, yesterday's uh, lecture done by Varian. And you can find like how the comparison in homogeneous and how the in heterogeneous frankly, or medium between type B, which is triple A, and type C uh, Accus or Monte Carlo. You can you can read this. It's it's nice and quick comparison and it's nice comparison as well. So you can you can check it. Okay, when I assign my phantoms inside inside my playing system, it depends which playing system I'm using or which which ma which algorithm I am I'm treating with. So for this example, I am here, I am assigning for physical material table. Once it's like that, so it's like type C or Monte Carlo one, which is delivering to material, those two material. And for this type, we are using like CT density table, which is our yeah, or most of all planning systems which using type B or yeah, non-Monte Carlo which deliver, calculate those delivered to water. So in, in this one, we are, so in this, in, in the type P, as you know, the calculation are related to scale to water. So all materials are scale to water. If it's like water, so it's relative density is one, it's long, it's open something, if drawn one point something, and it's direct, that's how the city density table are made. But for the type C, it's, yeah, so it's very important to use it, to assign the materials. It's what will be like material if I'm, it should be like water or bone or something like aluminum or whatever BMA, whatever it is. So I have to assign the water, that medium, the actual real medium. And this is actually, it's very, very important. If I'm using like an ion chamber inside, inside my, uh, phantom scan and put it place it inside my phantom. How can I account for or how can this will be calculated in my in my planning system? If for especially for type C for type C, if it was like I assigned it for water or assigned so I assigned for BMA or assigned the whole phantom with the ion chamber the same the same material, it will 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 it be like there's there will be any difference between each other's or it will be the same, it doesn't matter. 
here, when we physical material is water, so it will be assigned for water, all of this body. And, and okay. So I have like four scenarios. If I assigned whole the phantom and the detector as a whole, as a package, and assign it as PMMA. I will find that to deliver two grays, I should I will I should deliver like three five three point eight monetary units. Okay. If I have another scenario where I did like phantom is a water and detector is BMMA, and in that case I will find my monetary units drop to three two three point seven. Okay, so to, to deliver two, two grays uh, to the same point. And here if I'm assigning P, uh, the phantom itself to be in, in A and detector to water, I will have this 348.6. Three, three, and this is all phantom. Phantom and detectors are water. I should have this 323.4 three, monitor unit. So to deliver, two grays to the same point using the same phantom, I have different monetary units, as you can see. So wait, what's the problem? Where is my, which one is the correct one? That's, that's the most important thing. That's the, how, how we can get some discrepancy between calculated and measured. If I assigned my phantom, in correctly in to in my playing system and go to the measurement and find different measurements. That's uh, important of this kind of into -end test to check if I am calculating correctly or not. That's that's one. That's, that's the thing. So in that case, we need to be careful when we are assigning our phantoms. And in that case, as a physicist, as a, uh, I'm I'm dealing with phantoms. First thing when I receive my phantom is to study the characteristic of my phantom. And that is very important, actually. Very, very important to study the characteristic. Studying this characterization by CT, doing CT scan for the phantom, this is like on site study. And as well, to review all documents related to this phantom to know what exactly the relative to the density of this phantom and for what is the fabrication of this which material manufactured this phantom is. So that's that's very important thing. So please, if I have like a BMMA phantom or something like that, and and use the water phantom to measure, you can see how the difference in motor unit, it's like, you see the difference in motor unit. That means you will deliver those and you will measure completely different those than the calculated, okay? So please take care about this one. So if, if I don't assign the proper, the correct phantom and detector, that means it will be different, different calculated against measurement. I hope this is clear. I hope this is clear. Okay. Now, after I did my measurements, I applied this, I have my own phantom scan the phantom, use it for end-to-end -end test and did everything is fine and check that my DLG is okay, my transmission is, is okay, all measurements are fine, then absolute point dose point of view from absolute point dose. And also in end-to-end -end test, you need, as we mentioned before, you need to do these measurements in different positions. So you need to do in the high dose regions and low dose regions and as well in the at the edge of the beams and something like that. You need to think about doing your point dosage on all of these points just to pick up if you have a kind of in, in accurate factors implemented in your system. So you will pick up using this absolute dose. If you are using like fluence based measurements, it will not it will mask this this errors. Why? It, because in, we are using for gamma analysis and for gamma analysis we are dealing with three percent and three millimeters. So the those difference and those locate and point locations slightly different. So that's that's the idea of the gamma. So the gamma will may mask this kind of errors. So that's why it's important. It's really important to perform end-to-end -end test using the absolute 
those measurements. And taking into account all of these precautions we, we mentioned in our in the in this regarding the materials to be in, uh, for our phantoms, the proper detectors which should be used and the proper algorithm should be used. That's that's the idea. If I'm happy with my results and it's like as my results are perfect and my measures are at the same level of my calculating those in that case I can I can jump to another kind of relative relative end to end test. And in this one it's not it's not the relative which is gamma related, but it's like relative ion chambers or relative detectors. So relative is slightly it's easier than the absolute one. After fine tuning of beam modeling, we can use this one. If it's not if if I'm not happy or if I'm not sure from my model, please don't use this, don't jump to this point. So equating simple plan, so it's like A B B A plan, very simple open plan. Why we'll take to your idea. So TBS value to the detector reading. So we'll equating all of them are, are matching and then using the ratio as those conversion factors for the more complicated pieces. So we can get like a factor from calculate against the measure in the very simple plan for, for one detector and using and measuring different the other detector and take this uh, this factor and will I can use any fact any any chamber then or any fact factorized chamber to you to be used for my patient specific view later and I don't in that case I don't need to implement all factors like NDWs and all of other factors because I already it's like a kind of cross calibration but it's like a patient specific cross calibration it's not from the machine or QA calibration oh. at point of view. I have a quick question uh, while we're on the slide. We've got a couple of questions about the DLG. Could you could you quickly or briefly just explain what that is and how what the best way to measure that is? Similar to MLC transmission, I guess, as well. Okay, let me show you something. Could be because it's in the next presentation. Should be a kind of how to find you your to TBS and to find you your module. But let me, okay, this, I think this should be, yeah. This test, in this test, you you have like, it's like a kind of sliding window, okay? So you need to, you ideally, if you are taking like a film or 2D detector or is measuring here, or you have like a point dose measuring in the junction points. So it should be, you should measure those here. And if there is any any kind of deviation in the MLC transmission from so either if it's like less transmission entered or to the TBS that means it will make your measured dose is hotter or vice versa. So that's 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 the point of transmission. And if the DLG is how the it's like junctions between the segments. If it's not. If the MLC movement or position is not is is not accurately implemented in the TBS, that means you will have like in the junctions either lower or higher doses. Let me in the double there is a nice paper. It's like work instruction for double ABM to what sorry. In the double ABM 119, there is like a work instruction paper where yeah. It shows something. You, let me let me show you this one. I'm I'm just finding it now. Yeah, you're talking about TG one nineteen. Is yeah, that yeah. also where another question was? What the reference was for when you were talking about detectors having homogeneity across the chamber of ten percent and five percent? Was that also from TG one nineteen? Okay, TG one twenty. Yeah, TG one twenty. Yeah, I I I I have added all all references in this in the in the presentation. So if you see, this is the, the band test or the band plan. This is how how your profile should be in this junctions or something. It's like step, you know, the step plan. It's a very very you know, well known one. So if you have that, it, it's like sliding wind. So 
in in this place so you have this the first segment here will be like 100 multigrains and then you open the, the next field that will be from here to here and deliver another couple of multigrains and then deliver a couple of multigrains so you have like one one bank is open and the, bank, the other bank is stable and the other bank is moving and then you deliver it. and in the end of the accumulated those will be like this one if you have any issues with your mlc transmission that means this closed it was like closed so if it was like delivering here one monitor unit and this is closed actually should be closed in this place but if there is like transmission with two percent here that means it in the second step this will be one 100 monitor unit coming from here and we have like 200 two monitor units come from the previous segment that means it will be which either it will be like 102, it's not 100, something great. That's, that's the idea how, how, how this test measuring this, this the transmission. And the DLG is you'll, you'll find some, something around here if, if it's not correct. So it's if it's not, the junction is not, the, the position of MLC is not in the, in the correct position. That means here it will be either higher doses or lower doses. It depends where the MLC is. That's a quick idea of this of this test and how, how how it is performed. The DLG, how how you how you adjust DLG and the MLC transmission. That's more of a point about when you're fine tuning your TPS as opposed to validating your TPS. So, but you know, okay. thanks for the explanation. We got we got a couple of questions on the why exactly do you need to scan the phantom with your detector if you will override the density in the plan? Yeah, actually, it's it's, it's a good good question. There is a couple of things here. The idea is to scan the, the phantom with the, the, the detector. Is you are mimicking that you are here doing end-to-end -end test, so, so you don't you don't need to make any things for misplacement of the phantom of the detector or something like that. So you need to be sure that you are doing everything from end to end and same as accurately, and you can see it. This is one one important thing, and actually, in some some cases, and if you are in the more advanced technique like SPRT or SRS, which is the one millimeter deviation in the position of your of your detector, that means a huge difference in your calculate in your measure tools. Uh, I think it's done now. Yeah, let's see. We'll end the yeah. poll. And share the results. Yeah. It's better results, but still, yeah. It's better results, yeah. It was like 50 something, I think. Now it's like 78. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so back to this question. Yeah, so if any deviation in that, that means you have a lot of yeah, it's going to in the measurement. So that's that's the idea to see where exactly your chamber is. That's that's one of the most important thing. The other thing which was it was discussed in a lot of discussions that if you are overriding the ion chamber, actually you don't override the whole ion chamber, you are override the active volume only. But the other side, other other things or the other parts of the ion chamber still you still have it like steel or something like that. That's 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 somehow you will have some contribution from that. And one of the, when we are doing, this is for ion chambers, we did like for 2D arrays, for example. When we trying to scan, do the measurements for the patient specific QA fluence test or detectors, we don't use the detector for the scanning. And when we trying to measure it, we really found a huge discrepancy in the results. It was like 20, 30 percent outside uh, of, so it was like our gamma was like 70 percent or something like that. And when we implement that scan the phantom using the detector and implement everything, and it was like it was like 95, 96, which is yeah our gamma criteria. So that's 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 the idea. The idea is to mimic the real situation of your measurement. You need to put everything as you are doing your measurements. So if you are doing, you are doing point dose, 
with fine chamber, you need to scan with fine chamber. When you are eating, when you are doing 2D like with films or something like that, it's better to scan with the film itself. Otherwise, you will have some some discrepancy in the plant itself. Yeah. So just to summarize, and this last question I was asked. Okay, that's fine. Sense. Okay. Well, no, no, no. I mean, the point that you just made. You just override the active volume of the chamber and leave the phantoms <laughs> relative. That's that's what you need to do. Okay. So that's why you want to scan with your detectors to mimic, yeah. like you're saying, the actual measurement conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, or some gland, some phantoms are delivered with adapter, and there's, there is like a plug. It's like water equivalent plug. You, they, they placed it, and they some some people prefer to use it, but actually, it's better to when when you are using your detector, it's better to place your detector exactly and scan it. As a conclusion for today's presentation, sorry, it's long, long time now. I'm sorry for that. It's end-to-end -end test is crucial for MRT PMAT validation and should be done, as we will see. Using the correct phantom density is important for good results. Detector type and position and size affect the accuracy of measurements. Assign correct density for phantom and detector is important for measurements. And what comes next? The next will be how to fine tune the commissioning of a TPS. And before this is this is the references and yeah you can you can it's I think it's open source and if you if, if you want just yeah you can drop me a message and I can do it send it to you. Actually, Adam Adam yeah. is like a good spreadsheet for end-to-end -end calculation spreadsheet. You can use it for in, in your centers as well. And actually, he did patient specific QA tracking, tracking and trends spreadsheet, which we we mentioned that we need to do after doing the end to end and start clinical implementation of our technique. We need to do this tracking and trends to check the real clinical situations how it goes. And so there is like two spreadsheets should be ideally it will be sent to your emails from RCC by next week or th this week, I mean. So I hope, hopefully you just keep keep tuning to, keep looking to your emails and waiting for that. And there is a video should be, will be displayed now. I think Philip is, yeah, can yeah. run it now. Thank you.